An electromagnetic pulse, EMP, created by the high-altitude detonation of a nuclear weapon, has the potential to damage power delivery assets and impact bulk power system reliability over a wide area. High-altitude EMP is characterized by a high-magnitude, short-duration pulse, E1, an intermediate pulse that has characteristics similar to lightning, E2, and a late-time component referred to as E3, which is similar in nature to a severe geomagnetic disturbance event. Current perspectives on high-altitude EMP and its potential impact on society are reminiscent of the Y2K concerns at the turn of the millennium prior to 2000. Beliefs range from the world as we know it will come to an end, if there is a high-altitude nuclear burst, to the opposite view. It's not a big deal. Nothing much will happen. Neither extreme is credible, but no one knows for sure. Since we have never had a nuclear attack over anything like our current modern infrastructure, much of the information regarding the effects of high-altitude EMP on modern infrastructure or the capability of our adversaries to conduct such an attack is either classified or not easily accessible. The information that is abundantly available, especially over the Internet, is often inaccurate, based on misinformation and has the unintended consequence of undermining the validity of more serious sources. For example, concern has been raised by some stakeholders that high-altitude EMP could damage a large portion of the North American electric grid, resulting in significant damage to assets and long-term blackout, possibly lasting months or longer. An unclassified science-based approach is needed to assess the true impact of this threat. To fill this gap, EPRI initiated a three-year research project in April 2016 to address the potential threat by developing unclassified, technically-based research results that can be used by utilities to inform investment decisions. As a part of this project, EPRI is also working closely with the U.S. Department of Energy, the U.S. Department of Defense, national laboratories, and other industry groups. Electromagnetic pulse that is created when a nuclear weapon is detonated high above the Earth's surface. The height at which the weapon would be typically detonated, the so-called height of burst, can range from 30 kilometers to 500 kilometers or higher. However, in order to generate significant weapon effects from all three components, i.e. E1, E2, and E3, the height of burst is typically 100 kilometers or higher above the Earth's surface. Line of sight. A high-altitude nuclear burst can illuminate a very large region, essentially a line of sight from the burst location. The exposed regions for the given burst heights from a nuclear burst over the central U.S. would extend across the continent, beyond the east and west coasts, and outside of our borders to the north and south. Smile Diagram For an obvious reason, contour plots of peak E1 HEMP are often called smile diagrams. These diagrams illustrate the highly non-uniform nature of the resulting electric field. Here, the maximum electric field shown in red is indicated just slightly south of the ground zero location, which is Omaha. There is also a low field point, centered on the null point, north of ground zero. HEMP is governed by the Earth's magnetic field, geomagnetic field, and so the peak and null points are actually geomagnetically south and north from ground zero in the northern hemisphere. For E1, HEMP, we typically mean geomagnetic. The E1 pulse resulting from a high-altitude nuclear explosion is a fast, narrow pulse with large amplitude. The unclassified E1 pulse is characterized by a rise time of approximately 10 nanoseconds, 10 billionths of a second, and peak amplitude of 50 kilovolts per meter. Although the E1 pulse is a significant electric field, such fields are often observed in extra-high voltage substations during switching or fault events. However, as will be discussed later, in the case of high-altitude EMP, these threat levels are experienced over a very wide area, 
thousands of square miles, as opposed to a small area within a substation. E1 can result in damage to electronic components either directly or by coupling to the attached wires or cables. The area of impact can be quite large, depending on the height of burst. However, as previously shown, due to the non-uniform nature of the threat, not all areas are impacted equally. The E2 waveform is produced in the intermediate times after the explosion. The time scale here is from one microsecond, one millionth of a second, to about 10 milliseconds, 10 one thousandth of a second. The characteristics of the E2 waveform are similar to lightning. However, there are two important distinctions between E2 and lightning. First, it is important to understand that E2 does not attach itself to electric infrastructure in the same way that a direct lightning stroke does, as an example a direct strike to a transmission tower, but rather it couples to electric infrastructure as a nearby lightning stroke would couple to a distribution line. Secondly, the peak amplitude of the E2 waveform has a peak amplitude of only 0.1 kilovolts per meter, far less than that of a typical lightning stroke and the E1 pulse that occurs immediately before the E2 pulse. As such, potential impacts to electronics and other power system components is expected to be minimal. The last portion of a high-altitude EMP event is referred to as an E3 waveform. There are two components to the E3 wave. One is referred to as the blast wave, or E3A, and the second is called the heave wave, for E3B. The blast wave is created within the first 10 seconds after the nuclear blast and is a result of the expanding fireball. The second component, the E3B heave wave, is generated by the heaving of air heated by the nuclear explosion. The change in geomagnetic field resulting from the E3A and E3B waves induces low-frequency, quasi-DC, currents in the power grid, much like those generated by a severe geomagnetic disturbance event, but are significantly larger and of much shorter duration. The total duration of the E3A and E3B signals is on the order of four to five minutes. E3 has two potential impacts. One, voltage collapse due to increased reactive power consumption and misoperation of protection systems due to harmonics. And two, additional hotspot heating in transformers. EPRI initiated a three-year research project in April of 2016 to study the potential threat of high-altitude electromagnetic pulse attack on the power delivery system. An expectation of this project is to provide members with fact-based information that can be used to assess the impact of a high-altitude EMP attack on the bulk power system, develop cost-effective methods for hardening new and existing assets against the effects of a high-altitude EMP attack, identify advanced recovery options to supplement hardening and mitigation efforts. The research project is broken into several components. Threat characterization, EMP vulnerability, impacts, mitigation, hardening and recovery, decision support, trial implementation, member and stakeholder communication. EPRI believes that quantifying the vulnerability of substation-hardened microprocessor-based electronics to E1 is of primary concern, and thus these types of devices will be some of the first that are tested. EPRI is currently engaging with experts to design and build an EMP test facility, as well as develop procedures for performing the necessary tests. The specific makes and models of the equipment that will be initially tested are also being identified. Testing of insulation systems such as insulators, air, oil, and paper to determine their performance when subjected to E1 and E2 pulses is also very important and will also be initiated in parallel.
Applications of various assessment techniques and mitigation options will be catalogued and the effectiveness and lessons learned will be communicated to member utilities and stakeholders to provide background and venues for sharing new learning and research results in the most timely manner.